This video is sponsored by Universal Yums. And let me tell you, now is the best time to grab a box if you never have before. If you order a box right now from the link down at the top of the description, you'll receive their special red holiday box. Instead of coming with treats from just one country, this one comes packed with treats from 10 separate countries. Two of my favorite things from this box are the dark chocolate gingerbread bites from Germany. They are just absolutely decadent. And the nutty yogurt flavored nougat bar all the way from Greece. No matter what holiday you're celebrating this year, these make great gifts. And they are also great party games. Try out everything for yourself. Write down what you think about it and share it with everyone around you. It's a really fun thing to do with friends and family. And I cannot suggest getting one more right now. Check out that link in the top of the description, and thanks again to Universal Yums for sponsoring the channel. I knew from the first time I saw Lori Morning that something was different about her. It was last August, the first day of freshman orientation at university. After some initial sign-ins and assemblies, we'd been funneled into different buildings across the campus for various mini-classes on keeping up with college workload and being a responsible doormate and work-study opportunities, among several other things. Most of the classes were boring, and by mid-afternoon, my schedule sent me to an old chapel at the edge of campus for a class just called Getting to Know You. My... Anxiety and excitement was starting to fade by that point. This was fun and all, but I had no illusions that I was making real friendships or learning anything vital to my college experience, and I was heading quickly toward fatigued boredom. Stealing myself for another slow hour, I entered the chapel. It was in a small sanctuary but the pews had been replaced with a circle of metal folding chairs occupied by a dozen freshmen that looked the same as I was sure I did. Anxious, hopeful, and awkward as hell. Even the older woman, a lady in her forties that had to be the teacher, looked a little nervous. She even gave me a weak smile and nod as I took an empty seat that was left. Clearing her throat, she began by introducing herself and telling us that the point of this group was just to give us a chance to be open and meet other people in the incoming classes, that we were going to go around and answer a series of questions, one at a time, that if anyone didn't want to answer, that was perfectly fine just to say pass, and it would move on to the next person. I could feel myself getting more nervous already. What kind of things were they going to ask? I didn't have anything to hide, really, but I didn't want to play truth or pass with a bunch of strangers. It was embarrassing. The first questions were really mild. Name and where you're from. Favorite hobby. That kind of stuff. We'd go around giving answers that were probably half bullshit, and then the teacher gave us the next question. It was pretty boring, but I didn't mind. I was spending all my time trying not to look like I was staring at the girl across from me. She said her name was Lori Morning. At first, it was just because she was beautiful. She had a maturity and delicate grace that made her seem several years older than the other gawky boys and girls in the room. And then it was her voice. It was husky and rough while being smooth at the same time, like silk being drug over coarse granite. Her answers weren't remarkable in and of themselves. She liked painting. Her favorite movie was some German film I'd never heard of, but it was more the way she talked about them. Always with a slight pause and a small smile, as if she knew a joke that she wasn't quite ready to share. I didn't want to look like a creeper, but I kept sneaking glances at her when we went around the room again and again. She met my gaze briefly a couple of times, causing my heart to flutter, but for the most part she seemed to be paying attention to what we were saying. I tried to do the same, but between my own anxiety and her presence, it was easy to be distracted. Tony, are you wanting to answer, or do you want to pass this one on? Either is fine. I turned in confusion toward Mrs. Kreffler. 
shit. It was my turn again, and I didn't even know what the question was. Seeming to pick up on my embarrassed panic, the teacher repeated the question. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you? (laughs) What the fuck? How did we jump from where do you want to go on your dream vacation to this shit? My first instinct was to try and give an answer, and my mind was already crawling down into the mines of my memory, looking for the deepest, richest veins of pain and sadness and shame. I could already see flashes of my grandmother, of Richie, of the time... No, none of that was for these strangers. I didn't want to stand out or not seem cooperative, but shaking my head slightly, I told the teacher I passed. She gave me a smile and moved on. Some people actually did answer, though most of their responses didn't ring very true, either because they were so mild that it seemed unlikely that it was actually the worst thing they'd ever been through, or because they looked like they were making it up as it went. Not that I blamed them. What a weird and prying question to ask people, especially at orientation. Maybe the teacher was figuring that out too, because the next time she spoke, her voice seemed to tremble slightly. Lori, do do you want to respond? Lori looked at Kreffler and then turned to stare for a moment. Yes, I do. She looked down at her hands with a sniff, and then she began. When I was ten, my family went on a family vacation. We were traveling from Virginia and heading west. No particular destinations in mind, but with the loose idea that we would try and reach the Grand Canyon before turning around the following week. It was a lot of driving. All of us stuffed into the family SUV for hours every day as we zigzagged across highways and back roads looking for various points of interest advertised in brochures my mother had found at the latest gas station or visitor center. My parents seemed to be having a good time, but my brother and sister looked as over it as I was. Historical sites were boring, and the biggest or smallest whatever, that was just sad. But there was a light at the end of the tunnel. A mini golf place in Texas that had go-karts and laser tag. Dad had found it for us the day before, and I could tell by his expression that he thought this was something to keep our low-level grumbling from becoming a full-on whining chorus of bored children. And he wasn't wrong. We were all excited about doing something that might actually be fun, and by the time we reached the parking lot of Dirt Devil Dan's miniature golf and fun track, we were climbing over each other to get out of the car. There were cars in the parking lot, and we could hear people inside, people laughing and yelling and having fun. We didn't see anybody yet. But it was two in the afternoon on a Tuesday, and while the place looked big, it wasn't exactly a thriving location either. Still, I saw an old look pass between my parents before Dad gave a shrug. It looks kind of dead, but let's see. I don't see how it could be closed with all these people in there. If we get a bad vibe, we'll just leave, right? He looked questioningly at my mother and she nodded, her gaze drifting across the parking lot to a large yellow sign set up at the ticket booth. She glanced at us kids. Stay close, okay? We made our way to the entrance, and as we got closer, I was able to read the bright sign set up on the booth's window. It said, This week is Kids Week. In anticipation for our grand reopening, kids get in free. All children must be accompanied by one adult, and staff will collect payment for any adult visitors as you explore our attractions. Bear in mind, we're expanding, so some rise in attractions may not be in operation at all times. Pardon our dust. Another wary look passed between our parents, and while we kept heading in, Mom took my little sister's hand, and Dad repeated to me and Tom that we were all to stick together. 
I remember having a moment where I thought, I just thought how all strange this was. How lonely and old this place was. How forlorn and, well, creepy. But I, I couldn't hold on to that thought, that feeling somehow. A wind was stirring, twisting along the parking lot and pushing lightly at our backs as though coaxing us inside. When it passed, it was like it took our worries with it. I saw my father's shoulders relax. Mom no longer looked anxious, and she'd loosened her grip on Kelly's hand. And I felt my own nervous fear dissolving as we moved deeper in, heading in the direction of the laughter and screams. Because I think even then, we were seeking other people. They would show us everything was okay. If people were safely having fun, then we could too. If they were enjoying hot dogs and popcorn, it was likely safe to eat our first meal since an early breakfast on the road. If this place wasn't empty, it would feel less like we were walking across a graveyard. The park was larger than it had appeared in the brochure, but the handful of stands and small carnival rides we passed were all abandoned, eaten up with rust, and drowning in tall weeds and crawling vines. I know how this all sounds. We should have known from the start that something was wrong. And I think we did, in a way. It was just that somehow, in that place... It didn't matter. It was as if we were being driven by some deep, illogical instinct that said we had to keep moving, pushing forward, until we found confirmation that everything was different than it appeared. Until we found everyone else. I was holding Tom's hand tightly as we rounded the next corner. He was almost 15 and liked to act tough, but I knew he was scared too. His face had that same placid expression I could feel on my own, but his hand was sweaty and trembling in mine as we came into the view of the pit. It was probably a couple of hundred feet across, but went down 50 feet or more. But the cracked worn asphalt sloped gently down on our side and we barely paused before starting down. Voices, the noises of life and people were all coming from down in there, you see. We were standing in cold, muddy water at the bottom and I thought I could feel something move past my ankle as we headed toward a large outcropping of shattered concrete and orange-tinged rebar. I let out a whimper, and Mom looked back, giving me a strange smile. I know you're tired, honey, but I I think we're almost there. We were. As we reached the far side of the hill of rubble, we saw where the sounds were coming from. An old, rusty speaker... It was painted orange and red, though the patches of rust were far brighter than those faded swirls of color. And the speaker was small, didn't seem that loud up close. I didn't understand how we could have heard it from so far away. Didn't understand why someone would be playing sounds like this anyway. And that's when the singing started, and I realized we weren't alone. There were shadows with us. Shadows that shouldn't have been there in the gray sunshine of a Texas afternoon. But as I watched, they were growing darker, moving closer, and the singing that echoed across the pit seemed to get louder and louder until I thought I might shatter. I was hearing it inside, you see, and I could feel it breaking something in there. For a moment, I felt sure I was going to die. Of course, I didn't. They weren't there to kill us. Just teach us. 
Show us the flaws of our beliefs and the errors of our ways. Illuminate us with darkness and free us with binding. Show us a truer path lined with suffering and terror and the singular melody of something older and purer that wants to be new again. So we learned to sing as they did. I lost my family that day, and that loss was terrible in some ways. But at the same time, I gained a new family of sorts. There are riders in the storm, eyes that whisper and wounds that bite, and they're still growing. We scatter to the wind, you see. That dark, twisting wind pushes up across the world, down roads and fields, into the bright hearths of home and the black halls of the heart. It carries us where it wills, and we always land where there is more work to be done, more family to find. People that are being hunted by a destiny far greater than they could ever imagine. People like you. Her eyes were focused on me now, pulling me down, and I... Are you with me, son? I blinked as bright light flashed across my face. What? Can you tell me your name? My chest was on fire, my eyes full of burning water, throat tight and raw. I croaked out my response. Tony. I could barely make out the man that was crouched beside me, but I saw him nod. Well, Tony, you're going to be okay. The ambulance is on its way, but... Look, I'm not telling you to lie or anything, but you may want a lawyer before talking to any police about this, alright? I had no idea what he was talking about. As I wiped at my streaming eyes, I started taking in my surroundings. I was on a lawn on the edge of campus. Behind me was the old chapel, or what was left of it. It was burning down. The next three months were very stressful. There was an arson investigation, a psychological evaluation. Suspension of my acceptance into the college and tearful, angry conversations with my parents. The problem was that no one believed me. There had been no orientation classes scheduled in the old chapel. The chapel hadn't been used in over 15 years and was actually scheduled for demolition in the spring. There had been no sign of any other people there, and no records of a professor named Kreffler or a student named Laura Morning. At first, there were rumblings of arresting me for property damage, but there was no real evidence that I'd done anything other than almost die in an abandoned building that was on fire. If that econ professor hadn't been jogging and pulled me out, well... I guess in some ways I was really lucky. My parents got me a lawyer that threatened a countersuit big enough that everything went away, but it still left me with without college or plan until next fall. I spent some time back home, but I was restless there. I love my parents, but I don't think they believe me either. They don't say anything about it anymore, but there's a tension between us now that well, I needed to get away from that. So, I moved to Austin. I'm already admitted for the fall, and I'm working in the school bookstore part-time with the goal of converting it to a full-time work-study position in August. I haven't made any real friends yet, but that's okay. I've kind of wanted to be alone since... Well, since the day I met her. I know I'm not crazy. I didn't have a psychotic break or hallucination. Whatever happened in that chapel, it was real. She was real. 
Most of the time I'm relieved that I escaped the fire. Most days when I think about her bottomless eyes and her rough, tender voice pulling me in, my heart flutters with fear and I suppress a shudder. I try to push the thoughts away until I can breathe again, but some nights, some nights I don't sleep so good. I go out walking. My mind wrestles, my heart filled with some unknown thundering need. I travel aimlessly, roving miles from home at the whim of the ground beneath me and the breeze at my back. At first I would just go for an hour and then return home, tired and finally able to sleep. Then I started staying out later, walking farther. Moving with some mysterious purpose, I don't understand as my eyes search for the shadows and my ears listen for some sign of... What? For some time, I didn't know. And then last night, I heard people screaming, laughing. It was faint, coming from a couple of streets over at least. It was past three in the morning, and everything else was still, but I could hear the clear and steady murmur of people in the distance. Lots of people, all talking, yelling, squealing. I moved toward the sound like a starving dog, scenting its survival. I took a few minutes, but I found where the noise was coming from. It was a dingy alley, piled high with garbage and broken crates from the restaurant and bar that were next door. There was no one on the street outside, let alone in this alley, yet I could still hear them all as I moved toward the semi-dark. By the time I was halfway back, I had to pull out my phone to see anything. More trash. I thought I saw the furtive movement of a rat in one bag and forced myself to ignore it. I had to stay alert. I had to be careful, but also I had to know what. Resting on a pile of old liquor boxes was a speaker. It had been painted red and orange once upon a time, but it was the patches of darker rust that caught my light. The sounds, the lure, was coming from that. Though I realize now I wasn't really hearing the crowd with my ears. I was hearing it with my heart. I caught another movement at the corner of my vision, and when I looked up, I saw her standing there. She smiled, and I found myself wanting to run to her, but somehow I didn't quite dare. Instead, I just listened as she spoke, told me where I needed to go and what I needed to do, whispered things that were just for me. I'll end this here. The sun is coming up, and I found the gas station. My eyes burned with blowing sand as I crossed to the store, ignoring the cashier's greeting as I headed to a little wooden stand filled with colorful pamphlets. At the bottom... Tucked behind a sheaf of papers advertising a cowboy museum, I found what I was looking for. My heart was pounding as I went back to the car, and I can feel my excitement growing as I unfold the faded, greasy paper and find the map that points the way. I don't think it's far. Just a few more hours, and I'll finally be home. For those not accustomed to it, life in rural Eastern Europe can feel very lonely and isolating. I've spent all of my teenage life and most of my childhood in London, but about a year ago we were forced to move back to the old country due to financial reasons. I couldn't have been older than three or four when we first transitioned to the UK, so my memories of my hometown were foggy at best. An old apartment complex in the middle of an industrial district isn't exactly the most scenic place to grow up either, but though definitely drab at times, it always felt alive. 
there was always something to do, and the more interesting parts of town were just a short bus ride away. Here, there are only grasslands stretching for miles in whichever direction I look, not to mention the four-hour drive between me and the nearest city. For the record, I don't have a license. Most of my days out here are spent helping Dad and trying to find a decent internet connection, which is close to impossible. You have no idea how many attempts it took to post this. I've never been much of an extrovert, but having nobody to talk to or relate to takes a toll on you. The local population is primarily comprised of people past their 60s. The last family with a kid closer to my age had apparently moved near a decade ago, which, yeah, you can definitely see why. Unfortunately, as you've probably guessed, boredom hasn't been the worst thing that I've had to contend with. Not even close. I remember when I first saw her. It was still technically summer at the time, so evenings were tolerable, if not exactly warm. Dad and I were taking a walk along the dirt road that connects to the village to the nearest highway. He was talking about how I just needed to hold out for a few more years, and that we'll be able to move again once we save enough money. The prospect of spending literal years trapped in some desolate hamlet in the middle of nowhere isn't exactly assuring, but with him getting older and mom's disabilities, I just can't abandon them either. They're by no means perfect parents, but they've always tried their best, and I appreciate them for it. I remember looking over at my father, only to notice something in the distance past his shoulder. I strained my eyes. The gloom was far too dense to fully penetrate, but I could definitely distinguish the outline of someone standing amidst the tall grass, towering above it. The figure was that of a woman, a very tall and lanky woman. Her proportions weren't impossible, but they were intimidating, especially coupled with the slanted stance at the fact that she just stood there, swaying like a willow in a windstorm. Dad glanced over his shoulder as well, but then just looked back at me, confused. What is it? he asked. I was so taken aback by the question that I didn't know how to respond. How did he miss the giant woman standing in the middle of the field directly behind him? I watched as the imposing silhouette suddenly began to descend, almost as if being swallowed by the earth itself before disappearing beneath the grass entirely. Once I finally managed to articulate what I'd seen, Dad cut our walk short and we jogged home. There's nobody that lives here that's even come close to matching that description but it certainly wasn't beyond the realm of possibility that some creepy tall woman was wandering the steps at night. Weirdos aren't exclusive to the big city, you know. I felt nervous whenever I had to go out the next few days, but the odd encounter eventually slipped my mind. Neither of us ever told Mom, since we didn't want her to blow the whole thing out of proportion. Besides, she rarely left the house anyway. I'd all but forgotten about the woman in that step. That is until about a week or so later. We were called over by an old couple that lives at the edge of town, conveniently right by that same road. The request wasn't anything out of the ordinary. One of their goats had croaked during the night. Since both of them were in their 80s, they needed our help to drag it out of the pen. We did as they asked, and were rewarded for our efforts with coffee and toast. It was then that the wife said something to me that I'll never forget. I'll do my best to translate it. The old coot doesn't believe me, but I swear on our grandchildren's lives that I saw someone walking down the old path before I went to bed last night. At first I thought it could have been you. But the girl was much, much taller. Tallest woman I've ever seen. The way she walked was odd, too. And she was hurt, limping her way down to town. 
dad and I looked at each other from across the table. He chimed in on my behalf. What do you think it could have been? In hindsight, I'm thankful that he stopped me from confessing that I'd seen the woman too. We would have likely been accused of leading her back to the settlement. As I was soon about to find out, folk around these parts love having someone else to blame for their misfortunes. I don't know. She's not from around here, that's for sure. If you ask me, she's probably the reason our animals keep dying. Outsiders have always been a bad omen. Be quiet, you hag. The man and his daughter aren't here to listen to your crazy stories. The husband finally had a chance to intervene, which... After some more back and forth, it evolved into a typical domestic dispute. We thanked the elderly couple for their hospitality and promptly excused ourselves, though I doubt either of them noticed. Over the next several weeks, more and more animals kept turning up dead. The closest thing we have to a vet couldn't determine a cause. Goats, sheep, pigs, cattle, even dogs. Animals that looked completely healthy one day. We're gone the next. One day, my parents and I woke up to find a coop filled with dead chickens. There was nothing wrong with them as far as any of us could tell. They just lie there motionless, while the ones still alive pecked carelessly around them. There was talk of a plague, but the idea was quickly brushed aside. What sort of plague kills overnight with no preceding symptoms? It was almost as if they were being poisoned, which briefly became the leading theory. It wasn't until the start of October when a shepherd found something in a small birch grove that borders the town. Concealed between the trees was this crude arrangement of rocks. They were obviously placed there on purpose, and overlooking them was this cross between a scarecrow and a human-sized effigy made out of twigs. It had a rusted cowbell dangling from its neck and a ram skull for a head. There was something about the way it just stood there, arms raised, praising something none of us could see. It made me feel vulnerable. Tiny. Like there was this benevolent force perpetually looming over us. Witchcraft! Somebody yelled. We've been cursed! Another shouted. We scattered the rocks and burned the idol that same day. As I watched it get swallowed by the flames, I couldn't help but feel that this is what the one who placed it there intended. I still think that this is the exact moment we unknowingly doomed ourselves, and that everything that follows could have been prevented. It's too late now, though. Things only got worse as time went on. More animals kept dropping dead for no discernible reason. The bodies were piling up. We couldn't even use the meat as we still feared it might have somehow been tainted, so we ended up just burying them outside of town. It was when the crops, our main source of income and food, started withering that the things truly got desperate. Everyone became convinced that there was a witch among us, with my family being the most recent addition to the community, we were obviously the first to fall under scrutiny. Thankfully, my dad managed to appease the growing mob by pointing out that this supposed curse had severely impacted our living hood as well. It made no sense that we would be the ones responsible, and so accusations started getting levied against the next most plausible candidate. I won't be using her real name out of respect for the poor woman, so I'll just refer to her as Maria. Maria was about the same age as my mother, maybe slightly older, only she'd never married nor had any kids of her own. I never really got a clear answer as to why, and I'm not about to start speculating. All you need to know is that she'd been living in relative solitude for years, which made her a prime suspect in the eyes of the traditionalist populist. Adding to it was the fact that her livestock had overall been spared, though she wasn't even the sole outlier in that regard. 
There's no doubt in my mind that her targeting was largely the result of pre-existing prejudice, and that things were about to get a whole lot worse for her. Every day I would walk by her house and see a fresh batch of crosses carved into her door. People called her all kinds of names whenever they saw her in public. One time I even witnessed several women throw rocks at her, which the men eagerly encouraged. You might be wondering why the saner among us didn't do anything to help. The truth is, times were already tough, and nobody wanted to risk getting themselves or their loved ones implicated by proxy. Also, good luck getting any outside authorities to intervene. Nothing short of a murder would ever convince an officer to come out here. And as it happens, that's exactly what it took. Time has been somewhat of a blur since the day I found her. I remembered it had snowed the previous night. Everything was covered in this crisp sheet of white. I was probably on my way to the only general store that there is here. It was far too cold for a casual stroll. Suddenly I heard the distinct intermittent jingling of what sounded like a cowbell coming from somewhere nearby. As I circled past Maria's homestead, like I've always done, I saw her, displayed at the foot of her own doorstep like some perverse art exhibit. Her partially stripped body was tied to a fence post, swollen and bruised beyond recognition. Frost clung to her dark hair as it flapped in the freezing wind, obscuring disfigured features that hardly resembled a face anymore, and And there it was. The same bell that we'd found around the idol's neck now hung from hers, attached to a hoop of rope and barbed wire knocked about by the wind. I was so thoroughly desensitized by that point that I just turned around and went home, didn't even tell my parents. Someone did eventually call the police, but nothing really came out of it. There was an investigation. Suspects were questioned, but it ultimately got swept under the rug. Maria didn't have any relatives or friends that were willing to pursue the matter further, so it was just sort of forgotten about the time Christmas came around. People have their suspicions about who could have done it, of course. It is generally assumed to have been the shepherd with the help of a few of his drinking buddies, since he always been Maria's most outspoken detractor, even before any of this curse stuff happened. The thing is, I don't think he did it. There's a detail I've been deliberately neglecting to mention. I wanted to get the verifiable facts out of the way first. Though most of the events I've described, the aforementioned tall woman has been haunting nearly every waking moment of my life. Her presence was subtle at first, barely noticeable and easy to disregard. Maybe I could watch something swaying ominously in the distance that I couldn't fully make out. Perhaps there would be a long shadow stretching across the hallway at night, yet no one there to cast it. After the desecration of the ritual site, however, any semblance of subtlety was completely done away with. I saw her near everywhere I looked, occupying some dim corner, a lanky figure with a bluish-gray complexion, draped in a traditional white dress that was several sizes too small, as though it belonged to a child. Her hair was oily, sparse, barely clinging to her scalp and leaving little of her face to the imagination. God, that fucking face. Apart from its unhealthy hue, there was technically nothing wrong with it, but the way she would just stand there and look at me with this vacant smile and wide glassy eyes was just 
I honestly can't think of an adjective that accurately describes how repulsive it felt. Dad still didn't see her. I think my mom did, but she just plain refused to acknowledge it. Even if the disheveled woman was standing literally right there, looming over her. One time I cornered her about it, probably realizing I was teetering on the brink of mental collapse, she told me, Your grandmother used to say that there are things out there that like to watch but hate to be seen. Once you do, it's best to pretend like you don't. So that's what I did. I spent over two months pretending like the grinning entity watching us from across the room wasn't there. Like its emaciated frame wasn't the first thing that I would see whenever I stepped through that door. I wouldn't go as far to say I got used to it. Trying to go to sleep with that thing's silhouette propped against the opposite wall never got easy. And keep in mind that I was dealing with this in parallel with everything else going on in town. The reason why I'm telling you this, even though I probably shouldn't, is that the tall woman suddenly stopped peering around the house just a few days prior to me stumbling across Maria's body. Last week, another murder was reported. The goat herder's wife was found in much at the same state, with her battered remains tied to a tree directly outside their home and a cowbell dangling from her neck. I have a feeling she won't be the last one. So, let's summarize, shall we? I'm a teenage girl trapped in the middle of bumfuck nowhere with a homicidal ghost bitch that exclusively preys on women and may or may not be connected to the curse that's progressively decimating our livelihood. I have next to no access to the outside world and the police can't be arsed to help. <sighs> Fuck my life. <laughs>